narratives of Europe and narratives for Europe. Uh, what do people think in different member states about this European cooperation, European integration? Obviously, the elite, the elite, missed to <laughs> to uh, pick up the voices from the man and the woman in the street. This is, uh, for me, quite obvious. But this doesn't mean that I, I'm not in favor of this European project. I normally say to students that I'm a staunch uh, pro-European uh, lecturer, and then they know this. But if, you, if they think that I should uh, be too positive, then you have to write this down in the evaluation. I haven't seen it yet, so <laughs> it's quite okay. I will divide this uh, speech into, uh, into uh, sections. Uh, historical look back and then I start not in detail but I will start in the <laughs> in the 20s actually and move on uh, and then you will get some critical junctures I mean pictures when uh, things happened that had a, uh, a strong impact on, on on Sweden's relation with Europe and on I think that the elite, I mean, I know the, the outline that I got from Johannes. Uh, we shouldn't just focus on the elite and the political structure, but it is also like this that they are intertwined, as I heard the word from, from Maria. Uh, I think it's, at least in Sweden, it's like this that, that uh, I mean, the view on Europe from the political elite is deeply rooted among. Swedes, even though there are differences, of course, from right to left, because uh, Nordic and Scandinavian politics is very much divided along this line, even though there is a new political landscape with uh, populism, etc. And then, uh, finally, a closing part will uh, show some stati uh, statistical data uh, concerning the, the Swedish attitudes over time. So. The first part, then, I have uh, I have called this, or the headline is the persistent national state, or the persistent national uh, nation state. Uh, I think if we go back to the late forties and uh, think about Europe of that time, I mean. Uh, there was a crisis on the continent, and they have to rebuild this. They have to <laughs> try to <laughs> how to find peace, and of course, as well, when it comes to rhetor uh, rhetorics, a place in the sun. I mean, this going back to Rome and, and uh, Jerusalem and Athens, etc. The legacy, so to speak. Uh, so I mean, it's a, it's a point to underline that. Uh, the Rome Treaty was <laughs> signed in Rome. <laughs> uh, and then what has this to do with Sweden? I'm not discussing uh, during this lecture the Swedish behavior during the World War. Anyway, you can call it whatever you want. But we didn't take part in this even though we, we made some uh, remissions uh, uh, in some cases. And at the same time, we had a lot of hundreds of thousands of volunteers helping Finland during the Soviet uh, aggression, etc. But we can leave this. But I think the Swedish picture among uh, politicians, late 40s, was that uh, is Sweden part of Europe? Of course, from a geographical point, we are. But when it comes to, I mean, looking at Europe, what was the picture of Europe? It was a war, and it was a political development that wasn't maybe in the forefront of, of uh, democratic development, etc. So this was quite uh, decisive for many Swedish politicians, and for Swedes, I would say. Because then, uh, I mean, there was the three Ks, what can we learn? And I will come back uh, to this. What can we learn from Europe? This is about capitalism, 
It is about uh, conservatism and it's about uh, Catholicism. And compare them to the, the strong social democratic uh, party who took power in 1932 and reigned for 44 years until 1976, even though in, in, uh, together with some parties, but they had the, uh, the, the post of the prime minister during that period. And this is, of course, uh, uh, very important to, to, uh, to underline. On the other hand, I think that the, the discussion in Europe in the late 40s, early 50s, I think this was divided into two parts, I mean, uh, or sections. One uh, group was very pro-federalistic, and this is easy to explain. The other group, the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Nota Bene, uh, Great Britain. They had more of a confederal view, sovereignty, not a super state. What is this? We don't need this. And then coming back to conservatism, capitalism, and, uh, and uh, Catholicism. Uh, not expressed like this, but the interpretation is this. Even though the, the engagement from many countries, all countries I would say, uh, was uh, apparent. I mean, that is a slogan. Nations have interests. This goes for Sweden, but I am quite sure it goes for Germany as well, and Belgium, and Portugal, and Spain. But then uh, it is, of course, uh, a question of how much are you prepared to give up in order to, etc. But I think that uh, there is, when it comes to, to entering the European Union, there is a strong dimension of, uh, of uh, interest. Uh, yes. Or should we say more? Um, I think that we can move on to another picture then. Mm -hmm. Whoops. That one? No, that's not working. Yes, I will come back to this Prime Minister, uh, Per Albin Hansson, a Swedish social democrat who reigned for, for, uh, from 1932 to 1946. Yeah. Uh, I think there was a, a legacy uh, from late 40s, during 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, that from a geographical point of view, we were, of course, part of Europe. But if you, I mean, Maria had a, a map, and if you could see it, I mean, Portugal is southwest, the outpost, and the other outlier up there is Sweden and Finland. So, uh, in some heated debates in Sweden, at least those who are against, they are always asking, do you really think that the Portuguese is prepared to defend Sweden and Finland against <laughs> Russia? And uh, then they put a problem on, so to speak, to, to discuss them. Uh, coming back now to, to the 30s, and this Per Albin Hansson, who was uh, the Swedish prime minister, uh, from 1932, and the democratization uh, was in a way taking place 1919-2021 after the First World War with uh, universal suffrage, etc. Even though the, in one chamber there were two chambers at that time, they, you had to earn some money to, to be allowed to, be, to vote and to be elected. Yeah. Uh, during the 30s, the Social Democrats, they started to, to uh, develop the country, to modernize the country, and there is a metaphor 
who is very important uh, to, to, uh, to grasp this. And this is uh, the Swedish public home policy. In German you should maybe say Wohlfahrtsstaat, welfare state. And they put a lot of energy into this uh, expanding the, the policy sector. Elderly care, health care, parental insurance, paid vacation, etc., etc., etc. And then they developed this during the 50s, 60s, and uh, 70s, 80s. But the, the grand period, so to speak, from for the Swedish society, the economy was maybe from the, the end of the Second World War until 1975, it was flourishing. This is uh, obvious. And then this had an impact on Swedes, the Swedish view on, on Europe and European integration. And uh, I also want to underline that um, this metaphor, a myth or not, I mean, uh, it, it can't just be a myth because then it won't work. So it's often like this with uh, those uh, narratives that there is part of truth in it and there is part of rhetorics and myths in it. Uh, it was strongly rooted at the grassroots level, I would say. And uh, it was all about a belief in social engineering and that's why there is a, a dimension that I have some problems with, even though I'm a Swede. But I'm married Polish since 20 years, so I have discovered that there are other ways to, to, uh, to uh, look upon things in the society. And in Sweden there is a strong, I, and this has to do with this, uh, I think, people's home uh, metaphor that there is a trait of complacency and uh, self-satisfaction and this is not on purpose that we are arrogant or something like that it's just uh, like this this is in our D our in the Swedish DNA I heard a lady in the office before retiring some ladies were discussing uh, Ladies from the administration, they were discussing childcare, etc. Younger than me, unfortunately. <laughs> anyway, then one lady said, uh huh, but this we know that the Swedish uh, healthcare is the best in the world. And as I was close to, to uh, retire, I could say what I wanted, because when I was a dean or a director for political science, I didn't dare, because then one shouldn't. And I asked this lady, do you really know this? Or have you checked it? Or have you some experience? No, this we know, she said. I think this is a good example. Or my ex-wife, sometimes when we went for private persons, uh, parties, she said, no politics tonight. <laughs> and you can laugh, yes. But this is very sensitive. I know <laughs> if we are not start, we don't start fighting, but there is, in the air that if you if you talk too much about this and that uh -huh, you are against our welfare society maybe this has uh, eroded nowadays but as i remember 70s 80s early 90s it was like this uh, yes this was about the swedish the people's home, the Swedish middle way, uh, kind of midway between uh, capitalism and socialism. And there were, of course, ideas coming from Germany and, and Bismarck and even from, from, uh, from uh, Great Britain, even though the British uh, dimension was more uh, revolutionary or to try to change the society. But the people's home, uh, in Sweden, I can even quote here from, from the Social Democratic uh, uh, Political Party site on, on the web. The base of the Folkhem vision is that the entire society ought to be like a small family where everybody contributes but also where everybody looks after one another. 
The Swedish Social Democrats' successes in the post-war period is often explained by the fact that the party managed to motivate major social reforms with the idea of the Folkheim People's Home and the National Families Joint Endeavour. Uh, let's leave this. Uh, another point that I want to underline is that I said that I should start with the, with the 20s. I mean, Sweden, after the World War, we were neutral during the First World War, even though there, everybody knew that the king of Sweden, Gustav V, at that time, had close connections with uh, Germany. And Hermann Göring had, uh, or were married, as far as I remember, to a, lady, a Swedish lady. Yeah. Anyway. The Swedish political standpoint during the 20s was very altruistic and we, the first Swedish social democratic prime minister, Jalma Branting, he was uh, quite eager to underline the importance of the League of Nations because there was a heated debate, should we really join this League of Nations, what is this, uh, do we need this, uh, ooh, like this. And then in the 30s, I think that one could uh, say that the Swedish view connected, or uh, the Swedish view on Europe, let's say, was very rejective. And this uh, came into our rucksack, and we had to, to, uh, to moon, move on with this uh, legacy. Because then, I said, as I said before, it was about uh, the development on the continent compared to the Swedish uh, de development and modernization. And then this re uh, rejection in a way lasted until early 90s when we, we the Social Democratic port Party in a footnote to a, uh, an economic crisis program said that uh, we should join the European Union. And we did in 95 together with uh, Finland and Austria. And then uh, the 12 became 15. And now we are uh, 28 uh, in the EU, as you know. Uh, another important reason to this rejection uh, not only than the people's home, this was the untouchable, I mean the Swedish picture of the untouchable neutrality. Mm -hmm. This was not based in, in the constitution, it was not uh, uh, guaranteed by the superpowers, etc. It was a political standpoint that you could change from one day to another. But this was so strong and especially during Olof Palme, the Prime Minister between 1969 until he, he was killed in 1986, uh, was very, very strong. And this is also included in the, in the package of <laughs> the Swedish view on Europe, so to speak. And uh, I have no time to, to uh, explain this, but I mean, we can come back to this if you have questions about it, but uh, it, there was a speech by the Swedish Prime Minister Tage uh, Lander who entered the, the, the Premiership in uh, 46 until 69 when Olof Palme came. And then it was like this, that um, it was a tricky world. The Berlin Wall, the Cold War, and then uh, the self-image of, of Sweden and Europe as, uh, as a small neutral country we have to go on with this. Otherwise it's uh, too dangerous. Even though we know that uh, Swedish politicians, they played under the cover, so to speak, with the, with the US and, and NATO. I mean, my picture is that they expected that if something happens, at least the US will help us. Yes, this was the, uh, the historical uh, uh, 
look back. I think that time is running, and then I will go to my second second part. Can we maybe move on with another picture? Yes, there you are, Ulla Palme, Bruno Kreisky, and uh, Willy Brandt. Actually, uh, I, as Johanna said, I have written extensively some in pieces in, in uh, English, and most of them in Swedish, and even books. And I have interviewed a lot of most of my empirical stuff of my writing is uh, based on interviews, so-called elite interviews. So I, when it comes to uh, Olaf Palme, I haven't, I have met him, but I haven't uh, interviewed him. But I have interviewed uh, Jöran Persson, who, who was the successor of, of Ingvar Karlsson, who was the successor of uh, Ulla Palme. And when it comes to the decision to join Europe, it's obvious when you read his memoirs, etc., that he made, uh, I mean, uh, he, he visited uh, Bruno Kreisky and even Felipe Gonzalez. They were uh, wandering in the Alps each summer. And uh, obviously, these two persons influenced Ingvar Carlsson to, to uh, realize that even a social democrat can be pro-European. So this was what I wanted to underline. Ulla Palme, he was, I mean, he was uh, a brilliant politician. 50% hated him and 50% adored him. And he was fluent in French and, and English and uh, German whatever language. And they say that in the late 60s, I mean persons around him, he was quite eager to change the Swedish position. But then the Davignon report came and the Werner report. And the Davignon report was about closer foreign policy cooperation. And the Werner report was a forerunner to, uh, to the Euro and EMU in a way. And then he realized that, no, it won't work. We can move on. Yes. Uh, now I just want to, to connect to one of the questions. What about the attitudes over time? Uh, here you have a Swedish attitude, the Swedish attitude towards the European Union, 92 to 2018. And the source is the Somme Institute at Gothenburg University, and Linda Berry has been kind to provide me with uh, this, uh, these figures. And as you can see then, uh, it's, yeah, let's start at the beginning. 92, we had our uh, referendum in 94, and then you can see that uh, those who were against between 92 and 94, they were uh, in the lead compared to those who were in favor of uh, a membership. And then at the referendum, they, the, the diagrams crossed each other, but then those who were against, they were still in the lead until uh, 2001, 2002. It was quite close for a short period, uh, 2004, 5, 6. Now there is something happening. Don't worry. Uh, and then from 2006, this is obvious, that then the Swedish opinion on uh, European cooperation, integration, whatever you call it, the gap is widening in favor of those who are pros. There is a dip when it comes to the financial crisis, but now, as you can see, and it's even higher today, I think this is uh, late 18, it's about 40% difference, but it's not... Uh, maybe like in Portugal then. So there is uh, still a divide and many parties are 
even though they officially nowadays not a single party is against there is written in in the party program of the of the leftish party and the Swed uh, Sweden Democrats I mean the populist party but now when it's an election they have pronounced that no 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 we are we are accepting this but it's still in the uh, party programs from those two parties. But the Social Democratic Party, if you go to the grassroots level, one can say that they are uh, divided, I would say, even though these figures uh, show something else. We can take... Uh, ah, no, wait, just a second. I mean, changes over time, and recent studies then, this study from 2018, there is, I mean, who is uh, thinking what? There is still a strong center periphery dimension. City versus the countryside. Laponia versus Stockholm, Gothenburg, Malmö. Northern Sweden, because it's quite stretchy. If you travel, then you have to travel 2,500 kilometers. So then you come down to Italy in a way, if you put it on a map. Uh, then they say that Stockholm is far away, Brussels is further. <laughs> Education and income play a strong role. The more education, the higher income, then you're more in favor of the European integration. Younger groups, especially those under 30 years old, they, today, they tend to be more positive than during the, the referendum. It's interesting. And there is no longer a gender gap, because once upon a time, the women, Swedish women were more against than Swedish men. But now it's <laughs> even like this, that Swedish women are a bit more positive than, than men. And... Uh, Swedish men, especially supporting populist parties, they are very much uh, against, one could say. Uh, to sum up, can we have another slide? No, uh, this is the U. No, this. This is the, but another one. The Euro opinion. You have this, yeah? Mm -hmm. the, the next one? Oh. Yes? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. oh sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I have no time to, to get, go into detail, but this is strange because <laughs> there is a 40% gap between in favor of when it comes to EU opinion, when it comes to your opinion. You can read a good proposal, a bad proposal. There is, it's upside down. And uh, this, I, I, I don't understand this, and uh, I, this is on the web then, so you can analyze this or put some questions. Uh, I just uh, realized that it is like this. To sum up, if we should say something about Sweden and the European ID, for me, a European ID is about an ideological configuration, a political including an economic configuration and a geographical configuration. When it comes to a big idea about Europe and European integration, federalism, etc., forget about Sweden. <laughs> I think that there is no, it's very much about pragmatism and not about uh, idealism. Uh, but when it comes to political configuration, I think that uh, Sweden, at least this is my picture, is kind of good pupil in the class, Musteknabe in German. They do what they uh, should do, and uh, sometimes some influence, sometimes not, etc. When it comes to geographical configuration, I think that the map is uh, quite important. We must have a look <laughs> on the map, and Sweden is uh, far away. And we are not part of the continent, so to speak, from a geographical point of view. So we can conclude by showing the next one, maybe. Yes. So this is my uh, 
picture that the Swedish opinion on the EU and the Euro, membership of the EU from a post-war perspective, from reluctance to acceptance, something like that. And when it comes to introduce the Euro, it's a totally dead question. Don't blame me, as I usually say, uh, because I voted yes, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, within a minority. And it's uh, varying between 10 to 20 percent in favor of, but not more, today. So that's the way it is, and uh, this, is, this has maybe something to do with this key metaphor, the Swedish people's home and the complacency, the self-satisfaction. But it can, of course, change, uh, because the paradox is that we have a, a very strong economy, a low unemployment, important, well-functioning export industry. Together with Germany, we have 40 to 50 percent of our GDP comes from export. Volvo, Saab, Jaskeripen, Electrolux, Sunbikyu. This is uh, the base for our welfare, so to speak. And uh, we have to see. And then the final one. It was a pleasure coming here. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> and if you want to, uh, to uh, contact me, have thoughts about these questions, don't hesitate to do this. Uh, you're more than welcome. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.